So we've gone from the wonderful, amazing Roger Bannister and uh, Eliud Kipchoge to the dirtiest race in history. Hello and welcome to this bonus episode as I chat history of running with writer and runner Duncan Larkin. He joins me as we discuss whether humans are natural long-distance runners, the ancient Olympics, Pheidippides and the Battle of Marathon, the runners of South and Central America all the way through to the First World War runners, the four-minute mile, the two-hour marathon and finally the dirtiest race in history. Coming up on Saturday, I have a conversation, following on from last Saturday's episode about the past and future of the British Army, with General David Petraeus and Lord Andrew Roberts talking about the conflicts post-Second World War. General Petraeus is the former commander of US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and was the director of the CIA. Please do rate and review and tell your friends if you can, I'd be hugely grateful. Until then, listen to myself and Duncan Larkin chatting running. Duncan Larkin, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you on. We're going to be talking about running because you are the author of Run Simple and the 30 Minute Runner. And it's history of running today. That's right, Ollie. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. I'm honored. I love your podcast. Oh, you're so kind. And listeners, Duncan got hold of me and said that he'd like to talk about history of running. And I am love running. So I also could think of a few few historical examples i think of of running that would be interesting for us to talk about and luckily in duncan we have a uh, have the man to do it right duncan let's let's get cracking running now i had mentioned to you when we were talking about setting this up one area that's of interest i think in the history of running is are we natural long distance runners there is a theory isn't there that that perhaps we are yes and um the short answer to that that i believe is yes i i think everybody there's a great book by chris mcdougall called born to run if you haven't read it read it it's great um uh, it makes you think differently about runners a lot of times when i coach a lot of runners i hear people say well i'm not a runner and i'm always like you're a runner I think, you know, I'm not an evolutionary scientist. I don't have that background, but Chris McDougall's book really convinced me that, you know, back to the hunter gatherers, I think that as a species, we've evolved to, to run. And in our modern day and age with the sedentary lifestyle and our, and our internet and our phones, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of gotten away from, you know, our roots. So the answer is yes. I think we're all born to run. Do you know what I loved about that book, apart from the fascinating story of the that uh, tribe in Mexico that are the natural runners. Yeah, the Tarahumara. Right, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about them actually, because they they have this kind of natural ability, but we don't see them in any of their runners entering in uh, sort of the marathon at the Olympics or anything, do we? You don't. Um, I mean, fascinating. A group of Native Americans. Theirs is, and just like you know, we'll talk about the Incans and the Chasqui, but just theirs is a necessity. You know, nomadic peoples. Ironically, there are some really good Tarumaran ultra runners. So the, they are a uh, long and slow is is the way to go type of uh, of runners. Northern Mexico. Uh, Chris McDougall kind of embedded himself, who wrote Born to Run with them, and really got them into the forefront. Fascinating group of people. And the other thing I liked about that book was that he recommended you don't need to spend fortunes on footwear, which is yeah. a philosophy that I have always followed. I could talk for an hour, and I know on this, on minimalism, um, he did. I have one critique of the book. So I wrote a book called Run Simple, which is not um, take off your shoes and go barefoot running. Chris McDougall is a big, you know, the Born to Run is a big, there's a type of shoe called Five Fingers. I don't know if you people have seen them, but and some people might have them, but you, they're like these coverings for your feet and each little rubber sole thing has a place for your toe. That was huge coming out of that book, that movement. I don't recommend that. I think you need, I, I do like the fact that you don't need a lot to go running, but I'm I'm a big proponent of, of shoes and getting the right shoe. Um, you don't need to spend a lot of money for it, but we aren't the Taramara. I'll speak for myself. You know, I'm a uh, middle-aged, uh, you know, <laughs> adding weight, adding all that weight on. And when I go running, I just, my body is not built to just, you know, slap on these five fingers and do the minimalist thing. So I, I really recommend people 
go to a shoe store, talk to an expert and have their feet analyzed and their stride analyzed and then get get put into the right shoe. But you don't need to throw money at this. So and that's the part I like about the about his book and kind of where I went with my book is, you know, unplug, take the electronics out, just go out running without all your data and your smart watches and, you know, your million dollar gadgetries, because that's really goes against the what I think the real spirit of running is. I completely agree. I, I don't listen to music when I go running because I almost go into a meditative Definitely. state. Definitely. It's such a great, uh, you know, it's a trance for me. Sometimes, you know, when I was training, I used to be a competitive marathoner when I was, you know, I had a hundred or so miles a week, I would go on these runs and I would just get lost. Like I wouldn't know where I would lose track of the miles. I'd just be so in, you know, in a meditative state. And if you've never done that, you know, people that are listening, have never done that before, just try, you know, go for a run. Don't bring your, you know, bring your smartphone, you know, for safety, but don't listen to music. Don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Hang know, on, why? Duncan. Let's not go too crazy. <laughs> Sorry. But that does kind of um, speak to the kind of running that our ancestors would have done in order. Because I think the theory is to sort of outpace your prey, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's outpace your prey. You know, you're out on the Serengeti, right? You know, you got to you gotta survive. So it's that you got it the fittest and the fastest and you got to you got to go and hunt. You know, it's the back back to the hunting. It was a survival based necessity for our ancestors. And another part of history that I was interested in, because, you know, the Olympic Games, which go back to antiquity, of course, in the Peloponnese in Greece. But even before that, there's these games in Ireland that are probably not familiar to many listeners. And the Greeks will obviously argue that theirs is the preeminent contest. And I'm sure I, I think, I, let's face it, it probably are the Olympics. But but these Teltian games. Yeah, but older than that. When you think of running, you think of the, literally the Olympics. We don't call them the Teltians, you know, but we should maybe because they predate the Greek Olympics. So I think 1600 BC is uh, in Ireland. And it was it was a ritual. Just, you know, the Greeks, the, the Greek, it was all about festivals and rituals. And it was a ritual for these Teltian games where they would honor the dead funerary rites. And as part of that, there would be events. And I don't know that we know too much about them in terms of like, did they run a marathon? Did they run, you know, we, I feel like we know more about the, the, um, the Greek Olympics in terms of what was done in the famous athletes. But one thing I did, I was aware of with the Teltian games is they brought them back, I think in the twenties, you know, and they were really popular. Yeah. It's something that I think, you know, we need to put back into uh, people's minds around history because it's a, uh, they, they, they're the OG Olympics. The OG Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Olympics themselves, which the preeminent contest in the Olympics was really having teams of horses. That's famous figures from the ancient world, including Nero and Alcibiades. But ru the running side of the Olympics, I don't know much about that, actually. That goes back to the, the word stadium. So they had stadia, um, which was a, a length that was run. And um, it goes back to, I think a lot of it is military, you know, so you go from the, uh, you know, I need to hunt to I need to win wars. <laughs> so we have tribes and then we win wars. So a lot of the running activities, especially in ancient Greece and in other cultures were tied to the, the concept of, uh, you know, being fit, fit for battle. And I know that uh, we'll probably get into Phidippides and, and all that, but, you know, there there's the concept of, um, I know that the Greeks competed in um, some events where they were, where they would wear armor, uh, 50 pounds of armor and run, and run in it. And um, the longest race held in the ancient Greek Olympics, it was around 5k and it was multiple stadia. So multiple, kind of like running the ovals on the track. And, and that's where we get that concept today of the modern track. Yeah, well, 5k, which is, of course, the, the length for part run. Do you have part run in America? Park park run. run. Park run doesn't sound familiar. We have so park. park run is this sort of, I would call it a phenomena, actually, that oh, has okay. swept not just this country. It's gone outside of Britain and, and you see, it, see a park run all over the world. It's taking advantage of a local park and then setting up. Uh, it's volunteer led and it's a 5K run and everyone can do it. All comers are encouraged. You go to a website, you print off a label. Yeah. And that gives you your own specific barcode. And then you run your 5K. And at the end, they just scan, the volunteer will scan your, your number. And then you get your time back uh, after the race. And it's always on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Huh. And it's this huge thing that 
started off, I think somewhere, I'm going to get this wrong, somewhere in London, but it's now all over the country and, and has expanded out into Europe and, and Australia and New Zealand. I have not heard of it. I, I love the concept. It sounds yeah. like minimalist 5K runs, you know, and um, laid back is the way to go. There are races out there where you can be competitive, but it sounds very, you know, collegial and fun, you know, and, and a, an event for people to just get out and exercise together. Right. You know, so you've mentioned Phidippides. Let's talk Phidippides. <laughs> He, yeah, I think if you go up to anybody, you sit next to somebody on a plane, you know, and, you know, like, oh, I'm a marathon or I write running books. A lot of people will bring up Phidippides, they'll bring up the marathon. So, you know, he's the famous messenger, the hemerodrome, you know, a day runner, which is what they had, these messengers um, in ancient Greece. 40 years old, believe it or not, from if you believe Herodotus. So the um, Herodotus was the first source for uh, um for this, but you know, the Battle of Marathon, uh, Greeks versus Persians, Athenians versus Persians, excuse me, Phidippides, um, there's all these different accounts. So it's this legend and this lore that comes with them. There's a myth and an ethos. If, if you go with Herodotus, Herodotus basically is like, he went to Sparta two days, I think, before the battle. He ran like 150 miles. And there's a modern day Spartathlon, which is you know, that is the distance that people run, that's a crazy distance from marathon to to sparta and he asked the spartans for help you know he asked for reinforcements and the spartans uh, i think it wasn't a full moon and they were like no we can't do this sorry and he ran back um i think that's herodotus and then it kind of the 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 you know there's the myth and then things kind of go from there to a syrian satirist named lucian who who basically wrote the whole narrative of the battle part was so after the battle he sees a persian ship that's heading towards athens you know the um the athenians have won and he runs back to athens which is the you know 25 25 miles um and says quote unquote you know we win or hail we are the winners and then he dies so th those are the that's kind of the weavings of the story, and then obviously everybody knows you know the the mod, you know the the marathon became the event you know in 18, 1896, the first modern Olympics was the marathon and it was uh, from marathon to Athens and then it moved to and the nineteen oh eight Olympics it was when it you know it was it was a set set distance of uh, twenty five miles and then it became the twenty six point two distance in the 1908 Olympics in London, where um, they added some distance for to run, I think it was from Windsor to the finish line, and they had to run um, an extra lap around the Royal Box. So that's where the 26.2 comes from. So that's so the, the British royal family to thank for that. <laughs> if you if you're cursing that final mile, I I wasn't going to go there. Yeah. I mean, if, yeah, when you get to that final, the, the you know, this, especially the point two, right. You know, cause a lot of <laughs> marathons, I've run a lot of marathons where you hit that, you see the 26 mile mark and then you're like, can I be done here? And then there's that point two, you know, and you're like, okay. Yeah. If you know well, your history, you can, you can curse the Royals, but. Well, I think that's, uh, the, the Royals may be criticized for many things and that's probably the least of them. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you are actually speaking to someone who's done the Athens marathon and oh, you, you do start. Well, it was fantastic. I did it first in 2009 and you, you start at marathon itself and which is a village for those listeners who, who aren't aware. It's a village on the North coast of Attica with Athens certainly ancient Athens being on the sort of towards the south coast of Attica and yeah, 20, 25 miles away. And you, when you start uh, the race is normally, it's called the Athens classic marathon and it begins just to the North of the battlefield. And it, the race is held in October, late October, early November. And both times I've done it, the weather's been horrible, uh, rain, wind, pretty miserable not quite how you imagine Greece but you run around the battlefield and it's quite it's quite nice actually because wow. yeah it, it's really it is very nice and then and then you run uphill towards Athens most of the races up uphill brutal yeah you're running in the steps of Phidippides I think the 2000 yeah 2004 Olympics was held in Athens and the the, the marathon was the last event and it was that same you know I remember watching it you know, on TV, and it was a brutal uphill slog. And then I think you, I think you cruise down into to Athens at the end. Yeah, you arrive into the Pan Athenaic Stadium. I think it is the uh, the the 
stadium from 1896. Amazing. Yeah. I've never done it. Done a lot. I've never done it. So it's on my bucket list for sure. There are direct flights to Athens from America now. I, I'm I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would I like to do it again because I've only done it. I've done it twice. I've got to do it three yeah. times. So perhaps, Duncan, perhaps yeah. we do it together. We'll do it right. together. Aspects of history, uh, you know. Cl- Indeed. Cl- we'll Indeed. do a park run with aspects of history run. Yeah. Well, uh-huh. speaking of Phidippides, there is this this race, isn't there? The Spartathon. The Spartathon, yeah. Yeah, that's a relatively newish, newer, and I think it was started by British guys. And it's covering that Herodotus narrative, right, from where he says that uh, Phidippides went before the battle and was asking for the Spartan help. He's yeah, Athens it's like to Sparta, miles. isn't it? Yeah, it's like 150 miles, I think. I looked into uh, doing it. Well, I think you have to have completed at least one ultra yeah. inside a certain time. And I think that's a good idea for them to have that, right? <laughs> it sounds grueling to me. I've never done it. Would love to do it, though. Mm. Maybe maybe after you and I do the Athens Marathon, you and I will Yeah, yeah, back. yeah. Maybe the next day or something, yeah. Right. So so you've mentioned the Incans. Yeah. And I know nothing about this. So please this, enlighten this me. Fascinating. And I didn't until, you know, I just... I just am fascinated with history. I mean, that's the thing that brought me to this wonderful podcast. I absolutely love this podcast. I listened to every episode. The Chazqui, they were Incan runners, and they were younger males that were trained just to run. And so the Incan Empire stretched for thousands of miles, and they had an amazing road network, you know, and an ama- bunch of rope bridges, and it was their form of communications. And so the these Chazqui they weren't just trained to run. They weren't just the fittest because they were, they were fit and they were chosen to be fit. They were also translators. So they carried two things. They called it a quipi, which was like a knotted string and it was colored for, it was like a code when it stood for various things, tell the you know person this and the governor of this, we need to tax this people and they would run. To, and there was a relay station split between each person would run a 10 mile around a 10 mile stretch. And they cover 10 times whatever that is. It's just an amazing amount in, in a day because they would be running very fast. And they had these tombos, which were these relay stations. So the, the Chasqui would have, he would be carrying the quipi, and then he had a patutu, which was a conch shell. And he would be running and he'd have to know, like, here, you're carrying this, these knotted strings. Here's your translation of this. He would, you know, show up blow the horn like a mile out, and then the, that would get the other um, Chasqui ready to go. And then he would hand off the, the quippy and like say, here's the translation of this. Here's the message, double checking. And then he would go and rest and be ready, you know, for the next day's running. Um, so that's how the Incan Empire stayed in contact. And it fascinating. These guys were chosen when they were young and they were exempt from doing manual labor. So this was their thing. And it was, a, uh, you know, an honor and it was a, it was a big deal to do. So if you showed a talent in running, then you 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 were exempted. You from. And is this something that is continued? Because it's it's uh, you mentioned this, and then obviously there were the Mexican uh, Native Americans that we were talking about. Yeah, is this something that there's this brilliant map I saw somewhere recently, and I'll stick it on the show notes, where you look at the the top twenty times for a, I think it's a um, either a ten k or a marathon in a map. And it's in this one area uh, yeah. stretching from Ethiopia to Kenya. Yeah. All these runners, top 20 in the world, and they're all from this sort of same. Yeah, Great Rift Valley for Kenya. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Is this something that obviously it's a natural talent in the Americas? Yeah. But is it continued today? I mean, is there any kind of legacy of running? I think there is a legacy of running. The the one thing that's fascinating fascinating about the Kenyans and Ethiopians because they abs- as you were saying they absolutely dominate the sport. They are well. I'll just speak for the Great Rift Valley. The the for the Kenyans, they're born at altitude, so you know they're already got their altitude training as a kid. And from talking to people and and talking, I've interviewed a ton of Kenyan runners. Their lifestyle is running. So they the, as kids, they're running all the time. There you know, there's a whole um, athletics culture and running culture within their community so they're running all the time and they're at altitude and there's not there's no sedentary lifestyle there they're out they're running so yeah and i think there's i think there is that continuation of the of that around you know runners of of certain areas having certain abilities do i think that kenyans will you know all the, the world records right now 
are held by Kenyans, both the male and female. I think it's going to stay that way for a long time. And I do think there's natural abilities there. And there have been, you know, runners from other areas that can hold that pace. I just think that our life, our lifestyle in the West is just not, not fit for purpose. And I think that's what's kind of holding a lot of other countries back is this sedentary lifestyle uh, and diet. Diet. Yeah, is so, so how important is diet then? I think it's, you are what you eat. It's not a cliche. And I know the Ethiopians eat injera. What's There's, that? I think it's a, it's like, um, it's a rice based pancake that you, you know, fill with vegetables and it's, it's delicious and it's just carb loading, right? So there's the, the whole carb concept of carb loading, loading, what you put in and fuel yourself is going to be super important, you know, and then there's the, obviously the hydration part. I, I think it plays a huge component if you're training for a race, but you just have to eat the right food. If you put junk in, you're not going to be able to, you know, you're not going to be able to perform. I love the, um, I'm obsessed with potatoes. So carb loading <laughs> works for me. Yeah. Yes. I, I like potato chips and fortune crisps. Oh, I, my, yes. <laughs> I don't think they count, do they? No, I wish they did. <laughs> yeah. I also right. like pasta. Too much so, of a too much pasta could be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, it can be. I mean, I can't remember what I, I, I when I ran my marathon in Athens, because I've only ever done done this in Athens. And you've how many marathons have you run? I've run 15. Bloody hell. Right. Well, yeah. I'm banging on about it like I'm I'm the expert, but I remember the night before my first one, I went to a Greek restaurant where I wanted to go to get a nice early night because you have to be up at five in the morning or whatever, which I'm sure you know about. And he applied me with ouzo and oh, raki. Oh boy. Okay. Is that what what's your view on that for preparation? No, prior? no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do not get drunk the night before a marathon. <laughs> get drunk after. <laughs> Celebrate. Be careful, actually. If you're, I, I'm, I'm dead serious now. If you do run a marathon and you, your body is so depleted at the end, I, I, I will tell you this. I don't drink anymore, but when I, when I did drink, I ran the Vermont City Marathon. I lived in Vermont at the time, and the last mile there, were, there was an unofficial water station, and they handed out beer. It was like super on the down low and like they would have gotten in big trouble. And I took it and I drank it. I, it destroyed me. Like it may, I, I walked the last part of it because it just went right to my head and I didn't feel good. So yeah, uh, drink like a, a, a couple of celebrate your marathon a couple of days after if you're hydrated, <laughs> you know, uh, re, rehydrated again. Um, oh, right. So, so beer, I would have thought would be filled with electrolytes and, and <laughs> good things yeah. like that. The, 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 uh, the beer companies would like you to, to, you know, it's only a matter of time, right? Like, you know, they've gotten the hard seltzers and they're cracking all these codes. So I'm pretty sure pretty soon, maybe we'll see that Gator, you know, the Gatorade of beer. <laughs> we'll get back on topic. So World War One, I, I think. Oh, is, World is War something I you wanted to talk about. Where I wanted to go on this was um, the concept of the trench runner. So one of the things, the themes that I'd love to think about is that, you know, running fits into so many places. But, you know, there were the trench runners in, in, in World War I. And, you know, there's Gallipoli messenger. You know, both sides had these dispatch runners and they would, um, you know, they'd be given messages from higher command. Uh, you know, if lines were cut. If you saw the movie 1917, uh, great movie, Sam Mendes, one shot, it's an amazing movie. Um, they're not running. Right. But they're runners or they're dispatch messengers. So and I have a personal connection with dispatch runners. And that is um, a uh, my great, great uncle. His name is Craddock Bagshaw. Um, my a, a lot of my family immigrated over um, from Ireland and Wales to Washington um, in the in the early 1800s, the state of Washington, not Washington, D.C. And um, Craddock was, uh, you know, from that family. Um, he he and his brother Enoch uh, Enoch Badshaw. If you Google him, he was a famous um, University of Washington football coach. But Craddock was his brother, and he was a private, and he was at the Battle of Amiens, and, and was injured on 11 August 1918. One thing I just I, I'm just was fascinated by is I can't get you know my sister's really been helping me try to learn about him. You know, other than a grave marker and a picture of him and a couple index cards that are like worn and you know shredded from official records of world war one i don't know too much about him other than he was a dispatch runner and he died in 1920 and from what i've read he died from lingering effects of the war so i'm kind of putting two and two together and i'm thinking that maybe he he was gassed suffered from a, from gas poison gas 
from the battle. And we all know what happened in 1919, right? You know, the Spanish flu came in, killed more people than World War One. So I'm just wondering if, if that got him. One thing that if I, if I may, Ollie, can, can I read a poem? Of course. A short one. I love war poetry. I've been, you know, Keith Douglas, World War II, Sassoon, Graves, Rosenberg, World War I, Owen, World War I. Um, there's an American, I found out this about this in my research of Craddock. There's an American, you don't think of a, you don't hear a lot about American World War I poets because the U.S. got in late. But there was a guy named John Allen Wyeth who was at the Battle of Amiens. He wasn't in the, the 160th First Infantry, the National Guard in Washington. He was in a different unit, but was at that battle that Craddock was there. And he wrote pretty, you know, I never, never had heard of him, but he's a pretty famous guy at the time. But he wrote a series of sonnets and called Chapilly Ridge. And he has one particular sonnet that's called Through the Valley. And it gives me chills because I'll, I'll read it and then, uh, you know, reflect on it. But he was a trench runner. He was a dispatch runner he ran um, and, and they paired you up. So he ran with somebody um, and he wrote through the valley about his experience. So I'll, I'll read it. All right, Tom. Yep. I got it fixed. Let's start a slipping crumbly path through scratching brush down to the river road along the shore, a clanging leap of fire behind black trees and a streak of shrillness slit the sky apart. A sand road, horses, guns in the cloudy rush and men teeth clenched on tubes who lashed and tore through silence. Black, still slopes, a distant sneeze. Hear that? I tell you, my eyes are beginning to smart. A vague black gulch ahead and the secret hush of evil creeping through the dark. We passed two soldiers, pain white, and a man they bore between, blind, twisting head and drunken knees like Christ. Come on, bud, there you go. You've just been gassed. I reflect on that and it's a powerful, powerful poem. I, I think about gassing. And I think about the clenching, you know, I read the clenching of the tubes, you know, I think um, I was in the military, uh, I was in the army infantry officer for five years and have worn a gas mask. And I think when they, he says clenching of the tubes, I think he was talking about, you know, the tube on your gas mask, maybe, you know, drinking the drinking tube that they had. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, this is where I'll go with this is like, they find this guy that's, you know, blind, twisting head and drunken knees, like Christ, come on, bud, there you've been gassed. I'm like, maybe that was my great, great uncle, you know, I mean, it kind of closes the whole circle. And it really brings and it makes me it's just such an evocative poem. And I really want to do it makes me kind of want to do a lot more research on my great, great uncle. And you know, when I have some time, and I can be retired, I, you know, I'll do that, maybe. Particularly injuries from chemical warfare during the First World War must be something that is, I guess, difficult to it's internal, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It always reminds me that there's the Wilfred Owen line <laughs> in Torture to Quorum Est, is the ecstasy of fumbling when they're trying to get the gas mask on. You only have so much time. The other thing I was thinking of that's evocative is the um, John Singer Sergeant painting. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Up yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a, 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 I think it's the moon or the sun. It's like an early morning haze and a mist. And there's a whole bunch of soldiers and it's the blind leading the blind. And they've all been gassed and they've got bandages over their head. It's, I've seen it in person. I, I think it is in Washington, D.C. Um, at the National Gallery. I've Have seen it been, in the National as well. So I, they yeah. must have loaned it or there must maybe, be more than maybe one. Maybe it was on loan. And, you know, I've been to so many art galleries. I can't remember and correct me if I'm wrong where it's at, but it is a huge painting. Um, and, and I love Sar you know, John Singer Sargent. So yeah. really well done. I'll put a link in to the show notes for Wonderful. the listeners if they want to check that out. I mean, it's in, I, I just come back from um, Vimy Ridge in in northern France, where the Canadians have a huge memorial. Yeah. And I was taken down into the tunnels underneath where they had runners there as well. Runners going from the tunnels up into the trenches and down again. But they all they all wore patches on their arms to signify the fact that they were runners, which, of course, made them targets for the enemy. You hear these stories about other wars, like I think in Vietnam, like the officers would take their, you know, shiny, uh, you know, take, or you don't want to stand out when you're, you know, you're having to carry a message. It's, they didn't run like a marathon. They didn't run like miles and miles and miles. They, um, it was the zigzagging of the trench. So I think a lot of this was like, if you've ever run in the forest, bounding, probably a lot of bounding, a lot of get out of my way, a lot of pissed off people, drunk people in the trench. You know, the, there's these obstacles and then you have to worry about getting shot. And um, 
the one thing I forgot to say about the John Allen White um, sonnet was um, he and his buddy were given a message to, to deliver to two battalions, but they didn't know where they were. And it was a sealed message. So I don't, it goes back to 1917. It's like, you got to deliver this message. And Gallipoli too, right? Same kind of theme. Get there before it's too late. So, you know, there was, the, there was reality. In some yeah, point. absolutely. I, I, I can't wait. I love your, you and Tim, I love your film reviews. Oh, you're so kind. I'll, I'll, I'll let Tim know. He'll be delighted. Oh, I love, I love Tim. I, a lot of your film reviews have made me go back and watch them because I was not a big fan of Lincoln when I watched it the first time. I thought it was kind of sappy, but you guys, you know, I, I listened to it. I rewatched it. I'm like, all right, it's a pretty good, movie, pretty good movie. Yeah, so it's a wordy movie, isn't it? Wordy, yeah, it's a bunch of men talking. I heard Oppenheimer is a bunch of men talking and an explosion. <laughs> yeah, I'm, we're going to be watching it in 70 millimeter. I don't know what that means. Tim does. <laughs> I don't know what it means either. Right, so now I've raised a few of these things, dear listeners, for Duncan to talk about. And one of the things I was, I've always been interested in, the four minute mile, which I think was a historic moment in the story of running. Definitely. And why? Why? I mean, obviously, I get that it broke a, a barrier, but it doesn't seem that. I mean, lots of people have done it. Is it that difficult? Was it that difficult? Why was it difficult? Yeah. So you know, hyperbole. I, I I avoid like the most amazing, the biggest, the greatest. A lot of that. You know, we live in this. Literally, we say the word awesome all the time. Like, really, does it bring awe? <laughs> you know. But this this is a big one. Roger Bannister, nineteen fifty four. He was 25 years old at the time. I mean, that's, you're in your 20, mid 20s, right? That's good. But that's, he ran it. The thing that I love about the story is that it was 6 May, 1954. Uh, he did it in, um, the, uh, in Oxford, three, in front of 3,000 spectators. And he wasn't like this guy that spent, he was an amateur. Like, I mean, he wasn't a guy that spent hours and hours and hours and days and days and days and had, you know, a lot of our athletes these days, I mean, not a lot, all of them, they, you know, the U S has these crazy training camps where you're, you know, sitting in an eggshell and you have music piped in and you're given these special things. Hopefully, you know, not, I know we'll get legal. legal substances, but you know, you do all this crazy stuff to, to, to run, to win, to get the medal. Bannister was not like that. I don't believe he read, he ran like competitively until he was 17. The other thing that's cool about this race was that a couple, couple cool things, the planets aligned, right? Cause there, I think there were 25 mile an hour winds uh, right before the event. And he, uh, they, you know, they died down. He was paced. So that was helpful. The other thing that's cool is just little factoid is Abrams from Chariots of Fire fame. He was the announcer uh, live on BBC. So there's that connection to Chariots of Fire with it. Harold Abrams. And what's the big deal about it? I mean, nobody had done it before. To me, it's like, uh, it's there, right? It's like a moon landing. It's a round number, you know, four, four minutes. Uh, four minutes is 15 miles an hour. So if you get in a car, just get in a car and just go 15, you know, and imagine doing that for four minutes. It, you know, 15 miles an hour doesn't sound that fast. I don't think I could sprint at that speed. I've gotten in the fours, you know, when I was in my prime, I think it's 439 is mine, but I can't wow. imagine another 39 seconds. I can't, I, it's death. Like the mile, if you've never run a mile on a track, it is, it is a sprint and the 800s that way too. And you got four laps, <laughs> four laps. That's a lot of sprinting. You know, the record is, uh, has was set um, by Moroccan El Garouge in 1999. It hasn't been broken since, so it's still out there. Um, st still a challenge for people. 3:43. That's his record. So maybe there'll be that. You know, who's going to break the 3:40 number? And we got the same thing for the marathon, right? I think. Well, yeah, marathon, who's going to break the the two hours? Yeah, Kipchoge did it, right? So I don't know if listeners are aware, but there is sub two hour marathon, right? Does anybody run a sub two hour marathon? Kipchoge did it, but he did it like on a, in Vienna, I think, uh, in a last year, like in a completely controlled environment with pacers, um, and it wasn't a certified course, so it's not. It's a big asterisk mark. I think again, I, I think it's an only only a matter of time, and it's that great number to try to beat. They you think I it'll go then the two hours? I think it'll go. I think it's only a matter of time. The one thing that's interesting is it, a lot of these are I've seen on some marathons, they have the run at the Iliad Kipchoge pace, and you just see these people like falling over you know it's like a padded thing but you see how fast the pace that he's running low four minute miles stringing those together unbelievable well another incredible achievement which didn't last long was 
in ni- in the 1988 100 meters <laughs> men's final of the Olympics in Seoul, which is yep. the, now being called the dirtiest race in history. Yep. Where I think Poor eight it. eight of the athletes of the eight seven have either subsequently were found to have taken performance enhancing drugs or uh, had question marks over them. The aspects of history, lawyers will ask me to say that. <laughs> so we've gone from the wonderful, amazing Roger Bannister, you know, and uh, Eliud Kipchoge to the dirtiest race, you know, in history. I, I remember it dating myself here, but I was a teenager and I, I, I watched this and I was been to running then. And I was like, oh, my God, because um, I think four four of the eight went under 10. So, you know, it was just an incredible, it was incredible. If you, even if you watch it now, it's an amazing race. I mean, uh, Johnson's just got that other gear. He gets like 9.79, I think, but he's a fall guy. I, this is Dunk, you know, lawyer, or whatever. This is Duncan's personal opinion. And I'm not a big Carl, I hope, you know, if Carl Lewis is a listener to the aspects of history, I'm in trouble. Please, Carl Lewis, if you are listening, don't take this out on aspects of history. I'm not a big Carl Lewis fan. He, I don't understand that. So you're American. He's won, what, more gold medals on the track than? Yeah. Yeah. And he long jumper. Why am I not? I think he was dirty. Um, he actually admitted it, I think in 2003, that he took performance enhancing drugs. And this is super controversial, right? But I think there was a cover up. 1988, I don't know if you remember the 84 Olympics, Cold War, uh, US, you know, or West versus East, Iron Curtain, Soviets, 1980 boycott for the US. Carlos was that, you know, that smiling guy that just was like, could do it all. An amazing athlete. I just feel like there's an asterisk next to him. I, I'm not saying I don't respect him or anything. Amazing athlete, amazing runner, amazing, well-rounded person. I just think that he probably got caught up in, you know, it's like baseball here in the U.S. Just everybody, was, you know, during the steroid era, like everybody was doing it. So do you put an asterisk next to that? Because, he, you know, everybody was doing it. Like seven out of the eight people, as you were said, in, in 88 in the final were we're, we're dirty. And it probably really belongs to, I think it was C- Calvin Smith. I think he got bronze. And he he said, like, I, I deserve the gold, not, not Lewis. He was so the I only one that... who hadn't been found to have taken any yeah. kind of Linford, well, no question mark. From your, your area, <laughs> Linford Christie. He well, was... he claimed it was tea. Yeah. He was found in, that was in 1988. He claimed it was tea. British tea is amazing, but I don't know. I think it might've been Korean tea. Ah, um, ah, okay. I don't think he brought a PG tips with him, but, but he then four years later won the Olympic gold in Barcelona. That era, you know, I just think I'm I, I'm going to come across as jaded. I just don't. Sometimes I think is the science ahead of the catching it, right? Like, well, it's a bit. It's a bit like the sort of the the Tour de France is about a sort of fifteen exactly. year period where you just don't. Well, it's likely. There was a lot of drug taking. I look at Lance Armstrong, right? I mean, I don't want to equate Carl Lewis, Lance Armstrong, but they're, I don't know, all American smiling, yay, USA, like dirty, you know? Um, but yeah, it goes back to every everybody's doing it, right? I just think there needs to be asterisks next to things. But I do worry, I have no proof of this. I just worry that, you know, some of the science, like, what is in the best interest is create is is the performance enhancing drug versus catching the performance enhancing drug on the in the on the athlete and Russia's is just horrible at Icarus if you haven't seen that documentary it's fantastic about doping um in mm. cycling so mm. you've written a couple of books i think i'm going to put the links in i mentioned them at the start but are there any other books you, you would recommend for anyone interested in running out there there are. And I'm going to go with some weird ones. I mean, other than Born to Run is a great book, a bestseller. <laughs> this is a weird one. I love like novels. There's a book called Once a Runner, which is a cult classic. It's by John L. Parker. And this is a, about a guy who's in college and he's trying to run under four minute mile, under the four minute mile. And it's it's not crazy like Holden Caulfield level, J.D. Salinger weird stuff, but it's got that vibe of like kind of a a guy and his pursuit, you know, and he's going through the world and his observations. And, you know, I, I really liked it. It really resonated with me when I was really a, a serious runner because it talks about just the feelings of of having to do these grueling workouts. So I, I think it's a good telling of what it's like to be a runner and even a competitive runner, what you have to go through. Um, 
So that's kind of like the novel, the fiction stuff. Um, if you break it out into the other part of it is like the how-to, like what's a good how-to book? Obviously promoting myself, but I wrote the 30 minute runner, which is for beginners. So just doing 30 minutes a day, very basic. And then I did run simple, which is getting rid of your electronics and running free and running without watches, smart watches and graphs and charts and overanalyzing your stuff. But back to the how-to, I'm a big um, Lydiard fan. So Lydiard was a coach in New Zealand who Peter Snell was an 800 meter runner, gold medalist. He had Snell running um, 20 miles a day. He was big on um, uh, concept of, you know, building that cardiovascular base. Lydiard's got a book called uh, Running with Lydiard, and he's also got Running Running to the Top, which are wonderful books if you're training for anything. He has a concept called periodization, which is getting, and this is what everybody does now. It's like you have phases of your of your year, you know, like this is your year where you're off. And when you're off, you're taking it easy. You're not training, you know, calm, you know, easy. Then you get into the, you know, base building where you're running, you're you're building up your cardiovascular and your musculoskeletal base. And then there's the speed and you layer on that and then you peak. It can be used for anybody, you know, it can be used for you know, if you're running your first 5k, you know, trying to, trying to find yourself, get your body into that peak shape. And then there's a weird, you know, big, huge, it's the Bible of running. It's called the lore of running by Timothy Noakes, everything you want to know about running. So it's got how to's, it's got the history. It has a lot of science in there. It's a big, dense read. It's a consultative guide for me. Great stuff. I'll, I'll put links in there. This has been a great chat. Wonderful chat. Thank you. I'll, I'm, I get super honored. Thanks so much for listening. As I mentioned at the start, plenty of great content to come with General Petraeus and Lord Roberts this Saturday. Until then, thank you and good night. Good night.